those of you that don't know me, I'm Patty Anthony, RN, registered nurse, <laughs> Bachelor of Science of Nursing, and a certified neuroscience registered nurse. So I set for a special exam that is in the neurosciences. And my talk today is going to focus on um, back last year, a bunch of nurses and I were talking about the brain tumor journey from diagnosis to end of life. And we came together and did a symposium for other nurses, talking to them about um, life planning and the change and focusing on quality of life. So I kind of figured I was going to bring that to you guys, since you're living it, and um, talk a little bit about your journey and how to try to make some things you know, that you might not be aware of and try to make it a little easier during that journey. And I apologize for my voice. So survivorship. Survivorship a lot is focused, you see it with cancer, of breast cancer. It's used as our survivorship. But what is the diagnosis of survivorship? It's really focusing on the continuum of care from the point that you're diagnosed until the end of life. Sometimes they've defined it to the end of treatment. So it includes everything, everyone that's part of your team. It includes your caregivers, which are sometimes different than your family members, your family members, your friends, um, the ability to get treatment, um, and anything that goes along with that. All the bumps in the rows, the physical bumps, the so psychosocial bumps, the financial bumps that you have, and everything that goes from the diagnosis throughout your whole treatment phase. So Victor and Megan, <laughs> who are here in our room today, um, are the picture of my, <laughs> my poster children. <laughs> so survivorship with brain tumors. So it's what is it defining? And it's learning to keep living. And I think some of you I know personally, so I might refer to you, Sue. I mean, you, 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 it's taking on a new challenge that you've been presented with and living through it for as many years, seven years, how many years? Almost 13. Almost 13, less than a year. So it's taking what has happened to you with this diagnosis and learning to live by adjusting your lifestyle and becoming a new quality of life. By managing symptoms. And later on, there's going to be a talk by um, Beth Gold, who is our surgical nurse practitioner. And she's going to talk about managing symptoms um, through palliative care. I think people have misconceptions with palliative care, which is really managing your symptoms while you're in treatment. It's not hospice. While you're in treatment, this, OK. Um, so managing symptoms and your emotions restructuring your financial future. You might be the breadwinner in your family. And by trying to remain positive. And I think that's one of the most important things. And people who went to Sue's talk on hope, putting hope and meaning not false hope, putting hope to look to the future and saying, how can I make this work and keep living? So how has it changed your life? And you're all living it. I'm sitting here talking about it. But you've had job loss, financial loss, quality of life, you can't do what you were able to once do. Or maybe um, you might be anticipating a surgery and what is that going to do to my quality of life? Cognitively, um, you might not be thinking as clearly. Epilepsy medication, your radiation treatments are all affecting everything that you do on a given day. Um, relationships, a lot of times we as practitioners don't talk about personal, sexual, you know, where are you at with that? Because sometimes that stops and we don't really bring it up. And us need to learn from you <laughs> because we need to do it together to work on how we can help you relive. Someone who's hemiparetic can't function in the same way that their loved one was used to them being with. So we have to relive, relearn how to live. Um, navigating the medical system. There is lack of communication amongst your health team. The primary doc not talking to the medical doc, the radiation oncologist giving you different information than your neurosurgeon. We needed to bring together. You're advocating for yourself, but we need to help do that for you and with you. Um, decisions on complex is issues. You walk into the doctor's office and we say you have a brain tumor and you can have surgery, you can have radiation, you can have chemo, you can go on a clinical trial, and then we leave the room. So how, you know, we need to help you understand that course and that mapping. 
Um, lack of appropriate education and information, because you know, <laughs> I didn't realize that. Um, but you know, we, we need to provide you with more information and make sure that you're asking the right questions. And insurance, disability, paperwork, getting dropped from disability, it's our job to help you navigate that system. So what does the research show? When I started looking at this talk last year, it, w it really showed how we focus as practitioners on the acute care. What are your symptoms when you're, you're experiencing? You're experiencing um, headaches, you're experiencing nausea and vomiting, you're weaker on one side, your seizures have increased. So we're so focused on your treatment and your pathway, what's next, do you have a recurrence, this is your next cycle. Um, you know, so we're wanting to improve the quantity of your life, which is, okay, let's see how, you know, what the next step is, what the eggs in the basket are, but we're not looking at the quality of life. So we need to pay attention more to and talk to you more about long-term effects that are overlooked. You know, how someone asked it today, what are the long-term effects of radiation, of treatment, of these clinical trials? Um, information and support services, what's out there for you? Um, Neuropsychology-wise, um, in the community, uh, transportation in Jersey is terrible. So, what can we do to have available to t you know for transportation and you know showing you the way to get around to your treatment? Family burdens. You know, I sat with a couple and we were talking about their tumor and the recurrence, but you know, they talked about not being in the same bedroom. Um, which I never even thought about, you know. So then that whole emotion came out and how they haven't had relations, they haven't been together, and the burden of that on their relationship because they weren't connected as they once were. So, you know, we don't talk about that a lot of times, but it needs to be brought up, be important, because then we can refer you to the appropriate people. You know, marriage counseling, it's all, it's all part of the journey that you're all taking. And financial issues. You know, um, we have somebody here that hasn't had an MRI because the hospital doesn't set their insurance and they have a 50% copay, so they're responsible for. So, what resources can we give to you to help you along this pathway? <clears throat> so, we need to focus not on quantity of life, but the quality of life. And that's where I think the wave of the future, we said it today, Dr. Brem, I think, said there's longer term surviving. You know, we are seeing people living longer, 10 years, 11 years, but now some of the effects of radiation are showing and, and treatment effects are showing, so you have this new quality of life. So we need to focus on how to get, how to give you the information um, and to learn to live life, and I think that's what's so important. Just, just ah, shoot, sorry. <laughs> I didn't curse. Um, so how can we help you? Um, and these are some questions that I think you need to address, you know, like, and someone again talked about it today. Long-term and short effect effects of treatment, how is it going to affect your quality of life? The surgery I'm going to have, am I going to be able to hold my newborn baby? And you're sitting in front of me, so I'm going to, you know, that was a huge concern, you know. <laughs> Megan was pregnant. Her husband was having surgery. He was, you know, it was in an area where he can have what we call ataxia. Was he going to be able to hold that child when he was born? You know, so going through those therapies and making sure we had that set up for him when he, you know, when he was done with surgery. I mean, those are the kind of important things to help improve quality of life. Treatment options and clinical trials. And again, I'm going to go to Dr. Brem. We know and we're seeing more in literature as time goes on that. The more positive, the more treatment that you have, like clinical trials plus second treatment, something like NovaCure, which is an added treatment in some cases to your therapy, it can be used solely. These are things that we know are, are hoping that in the future are going to extend life, but also give you that quality of life. Um, you know, by the working of the positive side of the treatment effect. So it's keeping you moving. And services, I mean, neuropsychology, um, and I think Norm, Norman is speaking now, it's so important to look at um, and, and getting a baseline. And we don't always do this, not everybody does it, is getting baseline neuropsych testing. Where are you at now? 
in development, in your memory. So if you haven't had neuropsych testing, it's something that we should consider um, because you want to know if there's a decline. So down the road, you might be saying, I'm not thinking as clearly as I was. Is it from depression? Is it from treatment effect? Is it from the tumor? So I mean, these are the things that neuropsychology can tease out. Um, psychiatry and physiatry. So someone who is having weakness would see a physiatrist who can tailor the care. If you have so much weakness in your foot where you have a foot drop and you can't lift your foot, it can be detrimental. You can be tripping and falling. And um, so you want assistive devices, walkers. They have um, devices that keep your foot so that it doesn't fall as you're, fall as you're walking so that this way you're not tripping. <clears throat> Um, and also looking at canes and quad canes, what's the best thing for you? Yes, they're not always attractive. People are vain, they don't want to, to use them, but we'd have, rather have you in the least amount of device, like a cane instead of a walker, but what's gonna make you safe so that you don't end up with a subdural hematoma in the emergency room because you hit your head. Um, social services. You know, we're not lucky enough that we have a social worker that works in our department, so a lot of times I'm trying to figure it all out. But if we can refer you to social services, um, you know, some of the bigger institutions, Duke, they have a wonderful social service. They can help with the transportation, with the funding issues, but there's help out there in the community. It's just finding that help that you need. Driver be rehabilitation. You know, there's one thing if you have seizures where you can't drive, but it's really, being able to get back on the road and being making sure you're safe. So they have something called driver rehabilitation. Um, community service, I mean, support groups. Um, you know, they're trying to get more support groups around so that you don't have to travel to them. Um, and just community, what's out there. If you, you know, um, John and Peggy, who are in the other room, they both had surgery. Oh, John, here, here, John's in the other room, Peggy. Yeah, I'm gonna use you because examples are great. They had food services when they were both in a situation where she couldn't do it and he couldn't do it. Um, food, paratrans, I mean, it's, it's wonderful services that are out there in the community. Yeah, Meals on Wheels. So I think it's so important to know that these things exist to help you live your life better. Um, these are the things that I find I get a lot about understanding disability. I'll never truly understand it because, you know, someone that can't work and they get pulled off a disability, don't get it. Um, the financial impact, and I don't know where Obamacare is going to take us. I don't know where affordable health care is going to take us. What I do see is increase in co-pays and, and, and um, services not being covered. So we're fighting more, and I think Glenn Dolphy talked a little bit about this, we're fighting more for services to be provided. So patient advocacy, I think, is going to be huge down the road. I mean, we'll see where it takes us. Medication coverage. There's a lot of resources out there to help with copays. Al Masella has one of the best. He gets $5,000 a year, not as strict. Timidar going generic. I don't know if Merck's going to, yeah, Timidar went generic. So Timidar is $15,000 for 42 days. but. With, and it's only $1,000 less for the generic. So Merck, when a company goes generic, the not generic, the brand name, sometimes drop their assistance program. So I don't know if we're going to have that down the future. And they, they've been very good. So these copay assistance program, which I'll talk about later, are going to be very important. Home care, palliative care, and hospice referrals. I'll, I'll have some slides on that. Um, Home care is important, but they don't cover a lot, so sometimes it's paying services out of pocket. Palliative care, managing your system, and hospice referrals when end of time. And how do we cope? Coping with our physical, emotional, cognitive changes, and coping with the family dynamic change. Oops. So navigating the system. Most important, when you walk into that doctor's office and you're just diagnosed, bring a notebook. What is my disease? Get copies of your report. You're at your right, you can ask for it. They might charge you. If you ask me, I won't charge. <laughs> but um, you know, knowing your disease, what is it? 
Going on the internet can sometimes be scary. Getting involved with a brain tumor network sometimes is scary because people sometimes who aren't doing well are sitting at home and they're trying to feel better so they're on the internet. So it waxes and weans. But um, I think talking to the appropriate people, people that are in the field, Alma Salva, the national foundations. Um, treatment op options. Take that time with that doctor. Sit down with those plans and say, and if you don't like what he's saying to you, it might be true, but get a second opinion because it's got to sink into you that, okay, this is what I have and this is the treatment I have to do. And if you get two different opinions, you might want to get a third, but then I would stop there because you're going to keep getting different opinions and going to a reputable place. One of my nurse friends, their family's being treated at another hospital by a medical oncologist. What they're going to do for him isn't something that any doctor does. And I said, that's not the second line of treatment for a GBM. You need to get another opinion. Um, clinical trials, am I a candidate? I mean, that's so important, but they are so strict. You know, they have certain criteria, certain age, certain tumor types. You know, ask these questions. People come in with lists of clinical trials. We say, yes, no, yes, no, maybe. You know, keep them in your basket. Handling treatments and schedules. We give out a calendar, but have a calendar. We can work with your calendar. Make appointments, keep it, keeping all information together. Use that binder, doctor's cards. When's my next appointment? My neurosurgeon wants my MRI here. Yeah, but you're done with your schedule here. Let's do your MRI here. You know, helping you coordinate that together. <laughs> keeping that communication book. Say you can't, your friend has to come instead of your spouse. Keep everything, have them take notes because you're both hearing two different things. When you're newly diagnosed or if you have a recurrence, you want that operative report, you want your treatment records, you want your pathology report, your MRI. When we say MRIs, not just the reports, the CD or the films, both. You don't have to, if they say we want the films, CDs are usually okay too. And they always want to compare old and new. And then sometimes if you have the very first one, we want to look at that too because sometimes a doctor might be following it for a long period of time, and then it might be growing a little bit, so it's always good to throw in one from a year later. They can say, you know, it's been growing a little bit, but now it's three centimeters bigger, you know, but over time. So you always want to throw in that one. Now this is something that I'm going to change the whole aspect. Um, fertility. When I was reading, 60% of health care professionals do not discuss this. And it's huge, especially when we have young people. I don't discuss it. Now I do after reading the lit literature. So fertility, um, I, uh, recently I was uh, on a top of a, I gave someone my number because his tumor was stable. It was a low grade. It changed. They're young. They just got married. We knew that they were family planning. So I gave him my cell phone number. I said, call me find out about a sperm bank, so I'm top of the Ferris wheel at Great Adventure talking to them about sperm banking. So if anyone heard me, they probably were laughing below me. But that's, it's so important. Chemo and radiation can affect your family planning. It can happen, um, but we, we do want to talk about sperm banking and re maybe referral to a fertility specialist. So caution. That we are so focused on getting your treatment together, getting your meds and the cost of your meds, that I sometimes don't talk about it. But while you're on therapy, Timidar, radiation, especially chemotherapy, you need to use a barrier method. You know, it, it's uh, conscious, um, condoms and during treatment and then several months afterwards. So usually six months after treatment stop, we can then allow you going back to your, your old ways. Um, again, and then sperm baking and fertility specialist. So fertility does happen. So Victor, who I showed him today, seven years, um, he has a low-grade tumor. Um, he had chemo radiation, and it completed in 2007, right? Yeah. Um, and they conceived naturally. They didn't know they were pregnant. We got a little card at our support group. <laughs> but um, so, I mean, it can happen, and that, that's okay. I mean, it, and it does happen. And we encourage it to happen because it's part of life. Um, I also have another young woman. Um, she was diagnosed in 2005. Her dad had died of a GBM. She was died with, uh, diagnosed with a GBM in 2005. She had chemotherapy, six months of Timidar. She didn't do anything with her eggs, but she did um, 
conceive with fertility. She and the baby's probably a little older than 18 months. Um, and she's trying for baby number two. And so, we're, you know, she's working on it. So I think it's important. And I just have another patient who's going to fertility stuff. She went through Timidar and we just referred her to a fertility specialist. So we think it's important. There's a lot of controversy because people think that patients who have tumors, that the tumors are gonna grow. That's not true. Um, so what it is is that certain tumor markers on certain types of tumors like meningiomas um, can grow because if they have the hormonal receptors, um, but normally no. So I mean, if you decide this is what you wanna do, we're gonna encourage it and we're gonna help you get there. Um, <clears throat> caring for the, what time do I stop? I just don't wanna, I can keep talking. Um, just somebody go like this, sit to me. Um, emotional report, a support. So people call me, think, I had one girl that called, she thought she was having a seizure, but it was her whole body shaking. She was so anxious, and she was not treating her anxiety. She was not dealing with her anxiety. She was depressed, she was scared, and so we need to recognize that, we need to. And it's all about mind and body being together. And you know, I know that mental illness has a big stigma to it, but so what? You have a brain tumor, you need to live life, you have kids, you're working, you're, you know, you're um, at, in school, we gotta deal with that. So going on something, whether it's a short-lived something, or Celexa, or Paxil, to get you over that hump and continue on it, why not do it if it's gonna make you feel better? We had one guy that didn't want to do anything. He sat in front of the TV. He had five grandchildren that weren't appreciating their grandpa. He's a different person on the medication. So to me, it's so important. Um, I try to refer to social work. Don't always have that available. Um, but there are networks. Um, some of these YMCAs have resources. Um, community centers have resources um, for counseling or support groups. Brain tumor support groups. Um, referral to different therapies. If you're not a group person, then individual therapy. Um, people go for yoga for and massages, anything that's gonna make you feel better. Some massage therapists are a little nervous to work on cancer patients. It's not in your lymph node system. So let them work on you, let them do deep, whatever's gonna relax you, let them do it. If smells bother you and that you know that can trigger a seizure, don't use aromatherapy. Work it and tailor it around yourself. Psychosocial concerns, uh, people who may be years out and still having some problems, let's try to reinstitute physical therapy. Let's get you speech therapy. You're having some spot, when you get tired and you have a deficit, your deficit's gonna be worse. If you get a urinary tract infection and you don't feel yourself, you're not talking right, you might have, it's all from the treatment, so let's get you into the appropriate, you know, treat the medical side of it, but if you need speech therapy because it's not coming back, you know, something like a flu or a common cold um, can make someone with a brain tumor 20 times worse than you or I. So they, it could put them on their butt and their back. So let's get them treated medically. And if something lingers, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational, fine motor, physical, gross motor. Again, emotional support. During lunch, there were slides going of Camp Jinka. If your kids, our cousins, our grandchildren are having problems, Camp Jinka is a camp that just deals with kids that are going through problems with the patient for family members who have a brain tumor. And it's two weeks in the summer and it's got rave reviews. Kids that have gone want to go back. Some of our patients' kids are counselors there now. Um, therapies, art therapy, what makes you tick? If you photograph, we're doing photography, go back to a photography class. Make yourself active and try to, you know, it might not be you always wanted to cook, now you're not working, take up cooking. I mean, try to do something that is out of the norms but it's going to keep you occupied. Again, I'm going to, neuropsychologist is very important. Um, assisting with cognitive therapies, finding new ways to learn how to deal with that forgetfulness. <clears throat> Lifestyle changes, setting new goals and priorities. I have patients that come in and say, okay, I want to go on this trip, I want to go this trip. I didn't know brain tumor patients traveled that much. And when you're on a clinical trial and everything is set in stone, these people want to go to India for three weeks, kills me. Because <laughs> I'm like, no, we need to get to see you this day, we can't see you that. Because then you have to document everything that it's, you're off the program, you know. So, but travel is important, setting new goals. If there's things you want to do, do it. 
we're not going to deny you unless you want to skydive like into the Alps. The attitude might, you know, may, may give you seizures. Um, dealing with the workplace, people want to return to work. Can, if you can't work a full day, can you work a part day and do the work you're doing? If you did numbers and, you know, you can't, you know, um, you can't do that mathematics of it anymore, then is there something else you can do in that field to help you do it? Um, and it's working within your limitations, and I'm going to use you. <laughs> you know, he, um, Angel emailed me and said, can I do this, this, and this? And I think he made the right choices. I mean, he thought it out in his own way, but he said he knew he was taxing his system. You know, and, you, and when you, you have to learn to adjust to your new lifestyle. It might not always be like this, and it might, you're going to go up and down. It's a roller coaster. So it's learning your limits, your fatigue level, what you can and cannot do. With seizures, it's making sure you stay hydrated, make sure, making sure you stay not tired, you know, fatigue when you're sick. New medications can lower your seizure threshold. So it's working within those new parameters. Going back to school, if you have seizures, sometimes we have to limit what you can do. Contact sports, worse with kids because they're not fitting in. So, you know, getting them involved in the counseling in their school system. New Jersey transportation issues, trying to find funding for the transportation issues is, is huge. Um, and it, sometimes it's trying to get rides and putting your name in the church bulletin and saying if someone can help me. And there are some patient advocate programs that will help find people to take you, do your grocery shopping, but it's, it's finding those community services. Um, developing diet and exercise plans. Exercise is important for beating fatigue, and it's also important for good mental stability. You can go away. We will schedule your vacations around your treatment. I have somebody that's on a Vastin, which is given every two weeks. He wants to go home and visit his family, so we're giving him a dose. He's going away for three weeks, missing one dose, and coming back and having one. Let him go. I mean, why not live life? He has to get his blood work when he's there, though. <clears throat> Disability. It used to be, before all these people went to Congress and advocated, you had to be on Medicare for two years before you can get disability. A astros an anaplastic astrocytoma and a GBM are part of an, a compassionate allowance diagnosis. This diagnosis allows you to get Medicare right away. So it gives you that opportunity. You don't have to wait two years. Um, there's about 25 to 30 rare diseases and 25 cancers, and we are one of them. Doesn't mean it can take three to five months to process the paperwork. Um, if accepted, you, might ha you can go to get back pay, but they can always relook at the situation and say, we're going to deny you, and then we have to refight for it. Um, and again, the first diagnosis, the first time you apply, it's 60% are declined. So you have to reapply. It's a pain in the butt, to be blunt. But reapply because you're more apt to get accepted. Um, Social, Social Security also rejects the reconsideration. So it's a process. It's advocating for yourself, finding people to help advocate it. But do do the appeal. Um, disability lawyers, I, um, attorneys, they advocate. They do this on a daily basis. Um, when you're at the doctor, tell them every symptom you're having because they need to document and make sure they're documenting it. Say, I told you this at the appointment, and Herb, I think you, you uh, benefited from this. I mean, making sure that you are detailed when you're talking to your doctor because that's going to help with your disability. And staying on top of that paperwork. And unfortunately, you know, Pa doctors have three days legally to, to turn over paperwork. Sometimes three days turns into three weeks. So you're going to, you know, give a call. You're done with my paperwork. Um, financial assistance, if a social worker is available, they can help navigate the system. If not, here are some um, little pointers. Um, know your plan. Every, some require pre-certification. Uh, pre more things are now requiring to be pre-certified. Lab work wasn't always required. It's now being required. Making sure a diagnosis goes with your lab work. If you call and say, listen, I'm having, I need my HDL, LDL, and all that, um, my cholesterol tested, I can't write for that because it's not supported by the diagnosis. 
So you want to um, make sure that it's supported by the diagnosis. I can do, you know, um, things to do with your blood work, uh, low levels and stuff like that, but cholesterol we can't do. Um, and sometimes you're required to go to a facility. If you get an MRI at a hospital facility, your insurance can tag on a hospital fee, which can be anywhere from $200 to $1,000. So you might have to go to a freestanding facility. So we've had patients that are saying, what is this extra fee? It's an insurance-driven fee if you go to an outside facility above your copay. So just make sure if you're getting it that you're not getting tagged on that fee. And you would know because you'd be getting billed for it. And make sure it's te testing's covered. Sometimes blood work, specialty genetic testing. The doctors say, I want this test done. They send it out to a specialty lab. $2,000 you can get slammed with. So make sure that you're calling your insurance company to know that. Um, some insurances have case managers assigned to you. With this new healthy way of living that a lot of these insurance companies are adapting, you might have a case manager. Call them, make them your patient advocate. Find out your drug benefits. You can't go to local pharmacies for chronic meds anymore. You need to go to mail-away pharmacies. It's cheaper for you. FDA approves certain drugs, certain drugs they don't. Dr. Landolfi alluded to that. Tarceva is used for like certain types of cancers, not for brain tumors. We use it for brain tumors, not always covered. So we need to make sure that we're in conjunction and, and making sure we're getting the appropriate testing done. Insurance appeals. Um, someone we know as part of our group works for QualCare. She said that most of the time people don't appeal so that those that do usually gets paid for. So that first appeal is very important. Um, high co-pays are going higher with the, the changes in um, health care. They're dropping things. Um, they're dropping testing that they might have used, you know, that used to have done and now increasing the copay on other things. Um, prior authorization is huge um, and not being able to get therapies and treatments because of cost and that should never happen. So how can you help in that situation? Pharmacy assistance programs, um, they help with, if you have insurance, they'll help cover the copay or they'll cover the whole copay. Um, Genentech for Avastin, Avastin is $17,000 per dose and the dose you have four doses per cycle. So that's $17,000 times four. $68,000, thank you. <laughs> but, um, and Timidar, even with the generic, it, it's, not, it's not something people can afford. And I don't know who has extra money in their bank accounts these days. Um, Braintumorcopays.org is part of virtual trials. Um, he met, you get $5,000 a year if you qualify. That helps with copays. That's for Novacure, Avastin, um, Timidar, and there's one other, I think. There's four things that it covers. Copays.org, um, PPRX.org, and Needy Meds are all the same. They help with copay assistance. If you go on to the National Brain Tumor Programs, there's a list, and they, they, some people will help you with PSC&G, with your other bills. There's a whole list on top of that. <clears throat> same thing with cancer care. And then some local pharmacy programs, they have um, like Walgreens, Target, they have like a $5 for generic kind of program. It might be $10 now. Um, but they do have certain drugs that they give out um, at lower rates if they're generic. Um, we have great programs for medication, but we don't have a lot for um, funding of transportation, for MRI copays, custodial care, helping to get um, resources into your home. The one thing I didn't mention, when you're in the hospital, ask for everything. It's more apt, before you're discharged, it's more apt to get paid for than when you're home and need that shower chair. Um, psychosocial services, psychiatry services, there are some places that work on a sliding scale, but not everybody. Um, so you're looking for national or organizations that have resources, hospital-funded programs. We have two programs here that are driven from um, people that are out in the community. We have a chili cook -off every year that raised $8,000 this year. I know, isn't that great? I have your thing. <laughs> and um, we also have a, a big golf outing that raised, I think, $15,000. That money goes into a program that only helps patient care. So we'll give um, 
you know, coat pays like people who can't afford their coat pays. Sometimes we help with MRIs. So there are programs that are hospital driven, are community driven to help with assistance. This is something that Al taught me about uh, viatical settlements. It's when you have an insurance party, you can sell it to a third party and surrender that cash value. So then that person takes over the benefit and you lose the policy, but you have that cash value of money so that you can use it for resources. Not the best thing to do, but if you need that money for treatment, there's something that's out there. Um, so it'll give, the owner receives the lump sum, the third party becomes the new owner of the policy. The average cost of care, I couldn't find anything but 2011 average care in the United States. For a private nursing home, $85,000 a year. Semi-private, $75,000 plus a year. Assisted living, um, $39,000 a year. And a lot of these places ask for an upfront chunk of change. And then home health care is $37,000. Um, so it, it's expensive. So if you don't have the insurance or if you have a copay, um, if you don't have the money to put up front, um, it's, it's very, very frustrating to get the care that you need. And it depends on your insurance company how much you'll be covered. Um, and a lot of the factors when they're looking at paying out go by Medicare, um, sometimes Medicaid covers. But what they cover is skilled nursing. So say you're telling me I want assistance at home when I leave the hospital. If there's not a skilled nursing, a change in treatment, um, a new like a, a dressing that needs to be changed, you know, skilled nursing might not be available to you. So you might not get a home health nurse. So that only happens when you get skilled nursing. And they only come two hours a day for about three days a week. So and the rest is an out-of-pocket expense. So non-skilled nursing, we have adult daycares. It has a stigma to it, you know, who wants to be thrown into an adult daycare? But sometimes it's worth it, and I think we're seeing a new generation of people going to adult daycares with early dementias, with people with epilepsy, because we have working families. So people can't stay home and need the care, and it's a cheaper form of babysitting. Um, but they do, if they're active, they can do different um, tasks during the day. They say chips during the day, but at least you know that they're in a facility where they're going to get their medication. And you know, so it, it's important, but it's something to think about if, if, if you can't um, afford a at home care. Senior centers have always functions to do that you can get involved in. Um, some of the communities do provide transportation and then Meals on Wheels, as we talked about. Some religious organizations have companion care where they come out and they'll sit, like, sit with somebody that's just home with surgery that can't be left alone, usually don't charge. They kind of do a, a babysitting. Some people don't want strangers in their house, but if you need to get to work or need to run the kids somewhere, having somebody from your local community helping you out could be beneficial. Um, difficult decisions and planning for the future. At one point, you might not be able to make decisions for yourself. So early on, when you can, it's important to think of a power of attorney. Someone to handle your affairs if you're, and this goes for everybody. I mean, every one of us can walk, any one of us can walk out like my nephew and get hit by a car. So I mean, I think it's so important that we have this, do I? No. <laughs> but a power of attorney to handle your affairs and a health care power of attorney. I would never have my parents as my health care parity of attorney because they would never pull the plug on me if they were, you know, I mean, so you have to think and sit down and look at somebody that is going to go with your wishes and know your wishes. And having that conversation is very important. And you need to put it on paper, you need to make copies, you need copies with you and accessible because that health care parity of attorney should have a copy because we've had patients that have come in and we can't find it in their home. Healthcare planning, um, knowing the process of a living will and that healthcare pro pro proxy. They do this, like I had simple surgery and my husband said, why are they asking for a living will? Anytime you step foot into the hospital, they're gonna ask you if you have a living will. And it's important to know, and you can go online, they have packets that you can go online to fill out. 
If something happens to you during surgery, what do you want? Do you want a feeding tube? Do you want um, respir you know, a respiratory um, assistance, whether it's just mask and oxygen, intubation? But, and what your outcome, and you can be very specific. If something is where there's no hope for me to survive, then this is what I want. And you can tailor it as the time goes on, and you can change it as time goes on. Do you want a feeding tube? Do you want certain medications? You know, it's, it's scary to think about, but I think it's important that it's an open conversation and it's talked about so that you don't put your loved one in a situation that they wouldn't know what your wishes were. And it's hard for the caregiver to let go. I just had this with my brother-in-law, whose father and mother died two days apart from each other. And it was very hard for him to accept that his mother didn't want treatment and be intubated um, because he didn't want to let go of her. But it was her will and her decision and completely acceptable. Um, this is what I call, there's something online called the Conversation Project, and it's exactly what I'm talking about. You can go online and download um, information about having the conversation. What are your wishes? What do you want to um, take place if X, Y, Z happens? How much treatment do you want? What is your definition of quality of life? Some people are happy with just being there, even if they are in a wheelchair. Others aren't. So what is your definition of quality of life? And where does that take you? And does your husband, your kids, know what your definition is? And how much treatment do you want if you're going to be incapacitated? I think it's important to think about and important to have that conversation. And this conversation project helps you through the process. So it's assisting each other. And you both should do it. Um, to know what your, your wants and needs are with medical treatment. And that's, did I talk too fast? <laughs> Any questions? Pardon? I know. I don't have a regular will or a living will right now. <laughs> but when I had the baby and I said, they asked me, do you have a living will? I said, yes. She goes, hold on, I'll be right back. I've never had someone say yes to that question before. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, no, I have a lot of patients that have them. And we do have you check off on it. Um, so. Sure. I want to take a second to uh, getting back to the, the Social Security. If you're, if you're applying and trying to qualify based on what your surgeon is, is going to tell Social Security, the, uh, the advice that Patty gave me in the support group was instrumental. She said, see a neuropsychologist. Mm -hmm. uh, get a neuropsychological work workup. I had been a professional in my whole life. I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. But I got the neuropsychological workup, and that turned my case so that I got my, my Social Security disability. Um, because my, my neurosurgeon uh, was only interested in, in the condition of my head, my tumor. He wasn't looking at my, he doesn't say, the, your surgeon doesn't spend enough, enough time with you to figure out if you're cognitively impaired. And the neuropsychological testing re re revealed that I am. <laughs> and when that was written up, it, the, the adjudicator that was deciding whether or not I was disabled looked at that report and said, okay. <laughs> uh, beyond the stable and improving reports that my neurosurgeon was giving them, the neuropsychologist had a whole different take. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't be deemed to have been disabled today if, if uh, Patty hadn't given me that advice. So. Thank you, Patty. Also, if you're under 65, you will get Occasionally, every two years, you'll get a form to update them, update um, Social Security about your ongoing um, situation. Right. Well, when I got the when I got granted the disability, it, with the letter, they say your case is up for review. In in my case, it's you know it's another it's 2020. Um, and by then, my 
disability benefit turns into a retirement benefit. Uh, as long as I don't earn, you know, if, I, if I'm going to go to work, if I don't, you know, they, they allow you to earn you know, $1,040 gross per month. Uh, if you don't earn more than that, they're not going to review you. <laughs> uh, so, but thank you, Patty, for, for putting, steering me on the course. Of one, thing that, one thing she talked about that truly, and I feel like I've been trying to educate even Dr. Landolfi through the years, is that, and we talk about it in our group all the time, is that when you have a brain tumor, you come out a different person. There is a yeah. different person, yeah. and I don't know about any of you, but I find that the family doesn't get it. People yeah. don't get it. Because we they, don't, they, we don't they always present as being disabled. Right. You look People normal. say, you look great. I went to my regular doctor, he said, I don't see a disability, you look fine. Right. I said, thanks a lot, doc. I haven't seen you for 12 years now. Yeah. Uh, we, it's an invisible, so, like so many disabilities, it's an in, it's invisible. Your expectations, people have the same expectations, and in patients, I find, I don't know if you find people are impatient with you. Yeah. I don't know how many you here are with your disability long enough, or your challenges, I call them challenges, I don't call them disabilities, I call them challenges, either physical or emotional, or whatever. Um, but I find that expectations are unrealistic sometimes. And I think to myself, I'm being hard on myself, and, and they don't get it. That I can't function as fast as I did, yeah, and I, mean, I can't think as quickly it's good, as I it's, did. It's good in a way not to present with, with a disability, but, it, but it's, there. It's, it's a two-edged sword, because mm -hmm. then you don't get, you know, you don't look like a lot of people who do present with a disability mm -hmm. who are going to immediately get a nod saying, oh yeah, this is a disabled person. <laughs> and I think where we do get it is in the support groups. I think the support groups get it, and the people that come out of the support group, they get it, and I think that's where it's a great resource. Yeah, but when even our medical doctors don't get it. <laughs> well, they're learning. <laughs> yeah. We're teaching them. Yeah. Okay, everybody, I think we need to swap, but thank you so much. Thank you.